This is EE698I, Nick Signal IC Design. And this is lecture number 13. In the last few classes, we have been discussing about the possible non idealities in a sampling switch. So let's quickly summarize what we have seen so far. First, we discussed about the effect of the finite on resistance of the switch. And we saw that because of this finite on resistance, we effectively have a first order RC circuit like this. Uh, this R is the on resistance, C is the sampling capacitor. So the output voltage will no longer be exactly identical to the input. And we saw that to make sure that the output tracks the input, we need to have the RC time constant to be much, much smaller than the available settling interval of TS by 2. And also we saw that when we try to realize this switch using a MOSFET, this on resistance can be a function of the input signal itself. And as a result, this will introduce nonlinearity. And if we need to have, if we want to realize an extremely linear switch, we need to use the gate boost tab switch. Next, we discussed about the noise. And we saw that when we try to sample an input, along with the input, we'll also be sampling the thermal noise of the switches. So the sample voltage will be the input plus some thermal noise. And this has a variance of KT by C, right? So this is something fundamental and we cannot avoid it, right? And we can reduce this thermal noise power by increasing the sampling capacitance value. And we also saw about the Bode's noise theorem, where if we have a network consisting of passive RLC elements, we saw how to find the mean squared noise looking into any port. And it was KT times one by C infinity minus one by CZ, right? So I would again like to highlight the fact that this result holds good for passive and passive RLC networks. Okay, so the moment you have any active device like op-amp or MOSFET, this result need not necessarily hold good. And we also saw another way in which circuit noise can affect our sampling operation, which was through clock jitter. And this was due to the noise in the clocking circuitry. That is the circuit that generates the sampling clock. And because of the clock jitter, instead of sampling the inputs at NTS, we were sampling at NTS plus Delta TN. And since Delta TN is a random variable and is not dependent on the input, it just added to the overall noise of the ADC. And this clock jitter is a serious problem when we try to sample high frequency inputs. Right? Because for a high frequency input, the signal changes quite rapidly. So even if you make a small error in the sampling time instant, the error you incur in the sampled voltage will be quite large. And we also saw about the effect of clock feed through. And this effectively resulted only in an offset voltage, which is usually trivial. And when we use a differential implementation, this offset gets canceled as well. And finally, we looked at the effect of signal dependent sampling. And this basically happens because the time at which the switch turns off depends on the input voltage itself. So instead of taking samples at NTS, we'll now be taking the samples at NTS plus Delta TN. But unlike the case with the clock jitter, this delta Tn is a function of the input voltage, and this will in turn result in nonlinearity. And we saw that one way to get rid of this effect or to minimize this effect was to make sure that the buffers driving the gate, gate of the MOSFET switch, MOSFET switch is made strong so that the clock signal 
rises and falls more sharply okay and in this class we will also see one other neat trick that helps us get rid of this signal dependent sampling problem okay so till now we had been looking at all the possible non nonlinear realities when the mosfet was on or when it was going from on to off state so now let us see what or uh, what all can happen when the mosfet is actually turned off so let us say this is my switch realized using a mosfet this is the sampling capacitor okay, and to make sure the switch is turned off we apply zero volts to the gate or any appropriate voltage depending on the type of the switch we have okay so if let us say this is the clock signal right and say this is the input voltage so ideally we expect that when the clock is high the capacitor voltage tracks the input and the moment the clock falls low the voltage is held across the capacitor right but unfortunately as you all know mosfet comes with parasitic capacitors across each of its junctions like this right so this is my v in here v in of t okay and please note that this gate is going to be driven by some buffer right and this buffer will essentially comprise of a cmos inverter like this right so let's say this is the inverter okay and if this has to be at zero this has to be at vdd okay and uh, let me draw the cmos inverter completely so we'll have something like this Okay, and this will be at VDD, and since the gate will be tied to VDD, I mean gate will be connected to VDD to pull the gate voltage to zero here. The PMOS here will be turned off, right? And we'll have only this NMOS transistor pulling this node to ground. Okay, so this essentially is another switch that is pulling the gate voltage to ground. So I'll replace this. With a resistor that denotes the on resistance of that inverter when it pulls the gate to ground. Okay, so in the off state, what is the equivalent circuit we have? So well, we have the input voltage V in of T, right? And we have a capacitor. This capacitor, right? And that. Connected to this R inverter like this, and we also have this capacitor. So I'll just call it C off. Okay, so let's say we have C off here, and then we have one more capacitor, and finally the sampling capacitor. Okay, so although ideally we expect that. The output voltage is held across the capacitor because of this impedance network here. V in of t will lead to the output. Okay, and to simplify this, let's assume that this switch has a negligible resistance that we can consider it to be a short circuit. So the equivalent circuit is essentially V in of t. We have the off capacitor here. Connected to the sampling capacitor C. Okay, so just let me name them as CP1 and CP2. So this will be CP1, CP2. So we'll have CP1 connected to R inverter, which I am assuming it to be short, right? So I'll just have CP1 like this. Similarly, CP2 like this. Okay, and if this is driven by a voltage source like this. CP1 will no longer play any role, so I can simply ignore it. So the circuit simplifies to something like this. 
right? So this is C plus CP2. This is C of, and this is my P naught. Okay. And since C will be larger in many cases compared to CP2, this is approximately C, right? So what is the output voltage? That is this voltage. So that's going to be a capacitance divided between C of and C. And that's simply C of by C of plus C times V in of P. Right? So instead of the voltage being constant, we are going to have a small portion of the input getting coupled. So maybe it might do something like this. Okay. In most of the cases, this might not be of, this might not create a big issue simply because this sampling capacitance we have might be much larger than this off capacitance itself. Okay. So this might not have a significant impact, but for the sake of completeness, let's see what can we do if in case is, this becomes a problem. And the techniques we'll see to avoid this problem can also be used in cases where we have some undesired coupling. So the same techniques can be used in scenarios where we have undesired coupling to solve it. And by the way, this is called the hold mode. See through. So this is the fifth non-ideality. Okay, so this is the feed through happening from the input to the output during the whole phase. So let's see what are the solutions to this. So one solution to this problem is to identify the fact that the input is getting coupled to the output because that is the only path for the input, right? But let us say, I provide another low impedance path for the input. Then what will happen? The input current coming from the input will take that low impedance path and it will not disturb the capacitor voltage. So to do that, what we will do is the following. This single switch controlled by phi is split into two switches like this. And we have one more switch in between controlled by fiber. Okay, so this is going to be V naught P. So what will happen because of this? When phi equal to one, these two switches will turn on and this will be off, right? So what will happen? So we'll have the input getting connected directly to the sampling capacitor like this, ideally, right? And uh, this transistor is turned off. So we'll have some off capacitance because of that. Okay. So the input is getting sampled across this capacitor as usual. When phi equal to zero, when we turn these switches off, what will happen? This switch will get turned on so we have the input here. So when this switch is off, it will have an off capacitance. So I'll just draw it like this. Similarly, this switch here is also off. So it will also have its own off capacitance. And then we have the sampling capacitor here, but this vertical switch is on, right? So this will simply pull this node to zero. So now we can clearly see that current from the input simply goes here and the voltage across this capacitor is not changed. Okay. So this is called the T switch for obvious reasons and is one of the solutions to tackle this hold mode feed through. So there is one other way in which we can handle this problem. So to understand this first, let's see what happens in the whole mode feed through. So this is my input. 
So ideally we want the output samples to be equal to, so I say V out of T during the whole phase. Okay, it should be equal to simply V in of n, right? A constant value. But what happens? We also have a small portion of the input getting added. Okay. So in principle, if we can add minus alpha V in of T to this output, then there will be no problem. So in a fully differential case, we'll have something similar, right? So we will have the negative input. So I'll just call, yeah, I, I'm not considering the common mode. I'm just assuming that the common mode is fine and we have the fully differential signal applied. Okay, so here, what will happen? The output voltage, that will be minus V in of N and minus alpha v in of t, right? Again, due to the same of capacitance of this, right? And here I need to add plus alpha v in of t, okay? So here we have alpha v in of t because of the coupling from the input here to the output through this of capacitance. So this off switch is creating this alpha V in of T plus alpha V in of T here, right? And similarly, this off switch is creating this minus alpha V in of T here. So what we can do is the following. We can couple this signal here using the same switch we use, okay? And add it here. And we make sure that the switch is always off, okay? Similarly, we will take this point here and connect it using one more switch here. Remember all four switches are same identical switch. So what will happen now? Well, when the switches well, when the switch is on, that is these two switches are on, we'll have the input directly getting connected like this. Let me just pull it up. These two switches are always off. So we'll just have their off capacitance like this. Okay. But since this is connected to my plus pin and minus P in, so this node voltage is not getting changed. Right. But when the switches are off, that is these main switches are off. What will happen? Well, we have off capacitance of the top switch and the switch here. So again, let me pull it up. Okay. So these two capacitors are the off capacitors of these two switches. Okay, so this is Vin and minus in, right? So ideally, because of this capacitive coupling, we are going to have plus alpha V in and here minus alpha V, right? So since we also have this off switch here, that is also going to add one more off capacitor here, okay? So remember all the capacitors are same C off, right? Because they are of the same switch. So this path is going to add plus alpha V in here and it will cancel this feed. Similarly here, we have the other off capacitor that is due to this switch, okay? And that will add plus alpha V in, sorry, that will add minus alpha V in and it will completely cancel the feed. So now let's discuss one other critical problem when the transistor turns off. So first let's actually see what happens when the MOSFET is turned off. 
So this is the input here. This is the sampling capacitor. And when the MOSFET is on, say this is an NMOS switch, we are connecting it to VDD. What will happen? A channel is formed here, right, for them in the MOSFET. And what is the channel charge? Well, the channel charge is roughly WL COX times VGS minus VTHN, right? Again, this is approximately WL COX VDD minus V in minus VTHN. And please remember that this is only an approximate expression. And in practice, it turns out that this will be a nonlinear function of V. Okay, essentially a nonlinear function of VGS minus VTH. And so this will be a nonlinear function of the input voltage. Okay. And one obvious thing you can find here is the following this threshold voltage will depend on the source to bulk potential, right? And since for NMOS, we'll connect the substrate to ground, the source to bulk equal, is equal to V in. And because of that, the threshold voltage itself is some nonlinear function of the input voltage. Okay. So the bottom line is that this channel charge is a nonlinear function of the input voltage. So now let us say we try to turn the switch off. So the moment the switch turns off, there will be no channel here, right? So the channel charge is completely zero. So the charge that was present in the channel when the switch was turned on, it has to go somewhere, right? When the MOSFET is turned off and it has two paths to go. One it can go to the left or it can go to the right. And what fraction of this channel charge goes to the left and to the right is not very apparent from this. But one thing is clear that some fraction of this channel charge will definitely go to this right side. And it will add to the existing charge in the channel of the sampling capacitor. So ideally, the charge in the sampling capacitor is what? This is C times V, right? If this is input voltage. But now, if I call Q, Q1 as the channel charge, a fraction of this channel charge is going to get added to the sampling capacitor. So the total charge that is present on the sampling capacitor is C times V in plus some alpha times Q1. Okay. And we know that Q1 is a nonlinear function of the input voltage itself. As a result, the output voltage, that is the voltage across the capacitor, which is essentially the charge divided by the capacitance, is V in plus again some nonlinear function of the input. Right? So this is straight away going to add nonlinearity. Okay. And this effect is called charge injection. Please notice that this charge effect, charge injection is doing two things. One, it is injecting a fraction of the channel charge to the sampling capacitor. So channel charge injected to C or the sampling cap. Okay. And if the channel charge was not a function of the input, then there is no issues, right? So if Q1 is not dependent on the input, so the charge will add to, charge will be some offset charge that is getting added to the required charge of C times V. Okay, so the overall voltage after sampling will just be input plus some offset voltage. And as we discussed with clock feed through, this is not a big issue. 
and when we use a differential sampling circuit this effect will get cancelled but here what this charge injection is doing is the following since the channel charge is a nonlinear function of the input this charge injection is also adding nonlinearity to the sampling operation okay so this q1 is often referred to as the signal dependent charge because of the fact that it is a function of the input voltage itself okay so whenever we have this kind of a signal dependent charge injection it is going to introduce nonlinearity okay and please notice that if we were to use a gate bootstrap switch the gate to source voltage will be a constant right so for bootstrap switch gate to source voltage is a constant equal to vdd roughly so which means the channel charge to some extent is independent of the input okay but still because of this threshold voltage we'll have some nonlinear dependence but the moment you use a cmos switch or any kind of a normal mosfet switch this will be severe okay because the channel charge will be strongly dependent and will depend nonlinearly on the input voltage so let's see what what is the fix to this problem well first please notice that since this channel charge has two parts to go it can take any of the two parts and it splits between these two sides and finally it injects onto the sampling capacitor okay but let us say you don't want any of this channel charge to get onto the sampling capacitor what we need to do is the following before this switch turns on we need to make sure that this end looks like an open circuit the moment you do that all the charges will go to the left because you cannot have charges flowing into an open circuit right so to achieve this we do the following so this is the switch so i'll draw the capacitor horizontally like this so usually we will just connect this plate to ground right but instead we'll add one more switch here okay and what we need to do is the following before turning the switch this switch on off we will turn this switch off okay so if i label the transistors m1 and m2 so turn m2 off before m okay so the moment you turn m2 off m1 is still on right so this is going to be floating okay and this channel charge will be a nonlinear function of the input okay so when you try to turn this switch off we'll have the input here like this right so since the right side is an open circuit all the channel charge will go to the left and thus we can prevent charge injection okay and one thing you can ask is well this which is turning off so this will also inject some channel charge right and yes this which will inject channel charge but please notice that the channel charge in this switch q2 is independent of the input right so when this switch is on the gate is at vdd source is at zero so q2 is roughly wlcox into vdd minus vthn right and here even you can connect the substrate to ground so there is no dependence on vth on the input voltage at all right so the charge injection due to the switch m2 is not signal dependent and it will just add to the total charge like an offset okay so this technique is called bottom plate sampling okay so what's happening now first when we want to turn or when we want to sample the input 
we will turn M1 and M2 on. So effective circuit is something like this. So the input voltage will be sampled across the capacitor as usual, right? And next what we do is we turn M2 off. Okay. And let me draw what, yeah. So what will happen? The transistor M1 is still on, but M2 is off. Okay. So when we had, when you have M1 here, This is still on, okay. And finally you turn M1 also off. And when you turn it off, the channel charge, which is signal dependent charge, will have only the path to the left to go, right? And this way we'll be preventing this charge injection. So this is the overall schematic. Okay, so this is my input and if I call phi, I will denote it as phi e. Essentially, this means that this is an early version or an advanced version of phi. Okay, so in principle, we can have the clocks to be like this. If I call this as phi, what I need from phi is that it needs to turn the switch off earlier than the switch. So in principle, if we have phi e to be like this, it is fine. That is phi e falls off before phi. But uh, instead of generating clocks like this, it is much easier to generate clocks like this. Okay, so we don't do this and we do the following, where we have a clock phi e. And we delay this clock. where both the rising and falling edges are delayed. Okay, and we'll call this as phi. So now phi e is like an early or an advanced version of phi, right? And how do you do that? I mean, how do you generate it? Well, if you generate phi e, I'll just put a few inverters like this, probably two, or if you need more delay, you can add four inverters also, and call this as phi. And one other thing, thing to note here is the following. Please notice that the input voltage is getting sampled across the capacitor at this instant. Okay, so this is the instant when phi e falls to zero, and this is when this switch turns off. Okay, and the moment this switch turns off, the capacitor voltage cannot change, right? Because now it's an open circuit the capacitor cannot charge to any other voltage, right? So this is going to be our sampling instant. The falling edges of phi two, phi e. Okay. And since turning this switch off determines the sampling instant, even if phi e has a slow transition like this, Okay, so we know that this switch will turn off if this is VDD. So this switch will turn off when the gate voltage falls below the threshold voltage, right? And if this is the threshold voltage, then the time instant could be somewhere here. Okay. So even in the next cycle, at the same time instant, this will turn off. Right? So this means that the sampling instance are no longer dependent on the input voltage. Okay. So by using this bottom plate sampling technique, we have also solved the problem of signal dependent sampling. Okay. So now the sampling instance are signal independent. Now, although this works well to a first order, there is one other minor problem, which is the following. So if I label these transistors M1 and M2, when 
M2 turns off, ideally we expect that this is completely off and this looks like an open circuit. But we just saw that when a transistor is off, we will have an off capacitance associated with it. Okay. So what will happen because of this is the following. When M2 is off and M1 is still on, the equivalent circuit will look like this. We will have the input voltage, the main switch M1, which is still on. We'll have the sampling capacitor C and the off capacitor C off corresponding to the switch M2. And M1 will have a signal dependent channel charge, say Q1. And this will be a nonlinear function of the input. So when finally the switch M1 turns off, a fraction of this channel charge, say beta times Q1, will get injected onto the right like this. And since these two capacitors C and C of are in series, this charge beta Q1 gets added on to both these capacitors. Okay. And if I call the charge stored across the capacitor C in this polarity to be QC, what will it be? Ideally, it would have been C times V in, but now we'll have beta times Q1 getting added. Right. And similarly, the charge stored in this off capacitor C off in this polarity will be QC of equal to this charge, right? Beta times Q1. And please notice that here we have ignored the charge injection due to the turning off of the switch M2 because the charge stored in the channel of the switch M2 is not signal dependent and so it will not add any nonlinearity. So for the sake of simplicity in our analysis, we have ignored it. Okay, so the voltage stored across the capacitor C in this polarity, what will it be? It will be QC, the charge by the capacitance value, which will be V in plus beta Q1 by C. Similarly, the voltage stored across the off capacitor in this polarity will be QC of the charge by the capacitance C off and that will be beta Q1 by C off. Okay. So once both these switches M1 and M2 turn off, we'll have something like this. We'll have the sampling capacitor C and the off capacitor here and the voltages stored in these polarities are these. And we clearly see that if you look at the voltage stored across the sampling capacitor BC, it contains this charge injection component. And since Q1 is a nonlinear function of the input, this will introduce nonlinearity again. Right? And from these two, it is clear that if you want to cancel the effect of Q1, we need to do the following. We need to multiply VC with C, multiply VC off with C off and then subtract the two, right? And what this is, this is essentially the charge QC across the capacitor C and this is the charge stored in the off capacitor. So what we need to do is to subtract these two charges, right? So we can either do this or we can do minus QC plus QC off. So if you do the first thing, the total charge we get will be C times V in. And for the second case, it will be minus C times V in. And in both cases, the total charge is independent of Q1. Okay. And this is what we need to do to get rid of this residual charge injection also. Right. And to see what we need to do to subtract these two charges. First, let's do a quick brush up on basics of charges and capacitors. Let us say I have two capacitors, C1 and C2, 
charge to voltages V1 and V2. The charge stored in the first capacitor is C1 times C1 and the charge Q2 stored in the second capacitor is C2 times V2. Let us say that we wish to add these two charges. What do we need to do? Well, if we had two current sources, say I1 and I2, to add these two currents, what we do? We put them in parallel, right? So that the total current becomes I1 plus I2. And since current is nothing but the rate of flow of charges, even to add the charges, we need to put these two capacitors in parallel. Okay. So if these are C1 and C2, and if I call this node to be X, the total charge stored at the node X, QX, that will be equal to Q1 plus Q2. So what will be the voltage at the node X? That will be the total charge here, that is QX, by the total capacitance at that node, which is C1 plus C2, which is simply C1 V1 plus C2 V2 by C1 plus C2, okay? And this is all valid because of charge conservation. And what does charge conservation say? Well, if this is the node we are interested in, the total charge stored at this node X, which comprises of top plates of C1 and C2, that will be equal to the charges stored in the top plates of C1 and C2 before also, right? And the charge stored in the top plate of C1 is C1 V1, and the charge stored in the top plate of C2 is C2 V2. Okay, and that's what we get here. We can also solve for these voltages and charges using Kirchhoff's current law also. And you can do this because KCL is simply a byproduct of charge conservation, right? And we'll use KCL in Laplace domain because in Laplace domain, the currents and voltages through a capacitor is linearly related, right? So that will simplify the analysis. and for doing the analysis, we'll slightly redraw the circuit like this. So this was the circuit, right? C1 and C2. And the capacitor C1 has an initial voltage of V1, while C2 has an initial voltage of V2, right? And we can model this initial condition by having a capacitor with zero initial condition in series with a voltage source V1 by S, where V1 is the initial voltage across the capacitor. And similarly, we'll replace C2 like this. Okay. And please note that now C1 and C2 do not have any initial condition. Right. And if I call this voltage to be Vx, if I write KCL at this node, what I'll get, I'll have Vx of S minus V1 by S divided by the impedance of the capacitor that is 1 by SC1. That is the current here in this direction. Similarly, the current in the other capacitor will be Vx of S minus V2 by S by 1 by SC2. This will be 0. So this simplifies to Vx of S minus V1 by S times SC1 plus Vx of S minus V2 by S times SC2 to be 0. From this, we can find Vx of S to be C1 V1 plus C2 V2 by C1 plus C2 times 1 by S. Okay. So the time domain voltage will be C1 V1 plus C2 V2 by C1 plus C2 times U of T. So the steady state voltage will be this guy. And that's what charge conservation also predicted, right? So you can solve these kind of circuits using either charge conservation or using KCL also.
And please note that when we apply or do KCL in the Laplace domain, what we essentially do is that we say some of the currents in the Laplace domain to be zero, right? And if you look at I of S, what is, what is it? It is essentially integral I of T e power minus S T dt, right? And what is the dimensions of this? I of T has a units of amperes. This is dimensionless. And this has units of seconds, right? So I of S has units of ampere second, and that's essentially the units of charge as well. Okay. So when you do summation I of S equal to zero in KCL, this essentially does charge conservation only. Okay. So now let us see how to subtract two charges. Let's consider the same scenario once again. So let us say we have uh, C1 and C2 charge to V1 and V2. And let us say I wish to subtract Q1 from Q2, where Q1 is the charge stored in the first capacitor, Q2 is the charge stored in the second capacitor. How do we do that? Well, notice that the voltage stored across the capacitor in this polarity is V1, right? So if you look at the voltage in this polarity, it is minus V1, right? So to subtract the capacitor, to subtract the charges, instead of connecting the top plates of these two capacitors like this, wherein we are connecting the positive plates, we will flip the capacitor, that is flip the first capacitor and connect the bottom plate, that is the terminal corresponding to the negative potential, that we will connect it to the positive of the second capacitor and we'll ground the top plate of the capacitor C1. Right? So we are essentially flipping the first capacitor and connecting it to connecting it in parallel to the second capacitor. Again, we can quickly confirm this whether it is subtracting the charge using charge conservation. So here finally, what is the charge at this node? If I call it Q total, that will be equal to the charge in this configuration also. And here the charge we are interested in is the charge stored in the bottom plate of C1 and the top plate of C2, right? Charge stored in the bottom plate of C1 is what? That is a negative charge. That is minus C1 V1, sorry, minus C1 V1. And the charge stored in the top plate is plus C2 V2, right? And that's essentially minus Q1 plus Q2. Okay, so let's get back to a main circuit. So this is the circuit we have, right? And here we wish to subtract the charges of these two capacitors, right? And let's see how we can do that. So let me just copy paste this guy. Okay, and we saw that to subtract the charges, we need to connect the negative plate of one capacitor to the positive of the other, right? And here you clearly see that the negative of C is connected to the positive of C of. So all we need to do that, all we need to do is to put these two in parallel in this configuration. And we can do it by connecting a switch or connecting this plate to ground. Okay, this way, the total charge at this node X, that will be the charge stored in the top plate of this capacitor, that is QC of minus the charge here, that is QC, right? And this will give the total charge to be minus CV in. And what will be the voltage at the node X? That will be the total charge at the node X by the total capacitance that is C plus C of. 
So this will be minus C V in by C plus C off. And since off capacitance will be much smaller than the sampling capacitance, this will be roughly equal to minus V. Okay. And this way we can completely eliminate the signal dependent charge injection. Right. So this should be the equivalent circuit, right? After both the switches M1 and M2 turn off. Right. So how will the overall circuit look like? Well, we need to have these two switches for sure. Right. M1 and M2. They are clocked by phi and early version of phi, that is phi E. And after these two switches turn off, we need to connect this plate to ground so that the charges in this capacitor and this off capacitor will get separate. Right. And we can do that by having one more switch here that connects this plate to ground. Okay. And this is my B. So what should the control signal for this switch be? Is it phi E? Phi E bar or phi bar? Or what should it be? Please think about it. We'll continue from this point in the next class.